Hello, everyone. My guest today is Kanish Patel. He's the CTO and co-founder of Seven Rooms, where he leads the engineering team in development of the software. Before founding the company, he was team lead of scientific computing at ExxonMobil. He also received his BS in electrical computer engineering from the University of Texas at Austin and an MBA in finance and strategy from the New York University uh, Stern School of Business. Kanish, you ready to take us to the top? Yeah, for sure. All right. What is Seven Rooms and how do you guys make money? Sure. Uh, so Seven Rooms is a reservation seating and guest management platform. Uh, with a real focus on guest experience and guest data. Uh, So one thing that we found when we started the company back in 2011, uh, my co-founders and I, uh, was that we saw a lot of reservation systems out there that didn't put a focus on guest data. And we thought that was super odd because these these customers are in the business of providing hospitality and it starts with people. And so we thought guest data was the missing component and we wanted to make sure that whatever we built, we made that a focus point. Um, So what we build is uh, what they call in the industry is a front of house system. Uh, we help the technology, the technology managers help uh, the entire guest experience. So discovery and booking, in dining room experience, and then the, the post dining follow up. Okay. And is it a SaaS model? These folks pay per month? It's a SaaS business. Yes. Okay. What do people pay on average for this thing? On average, we charge about $500 a month per location. That's great. And and what are they getting for that? Is it a number of seats, number of wait staff, number of volume? How do you price? Like what utility based pricing do you use? Well, we essentially price based on location. So, um, so we have a lot of hospitality groups that work with us that have multiple locations. Mm-hmm. Uh, that pricing is really on a per location basis. It's unlimited users. It's unlimited usage. Um, one thing that sort of makes this unique is that a lot of the reservation platforms out there um, have both a consumer offering and the operator focused tools. Uh, we very much intentionally do not have a consumer offering. So we've been entirely focused on the operator. So just to be clear, if someone's using you and it's a restaurant that maybe has 20 people come through every, every night with two waiters and a different restaurant uses you at a different location with 200 waiters and 2000 people every night, it's the same price point. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. Okay. Interesting. Um, all right. Got it. And then put this on a timeline for me. When did you guys launch? We started the company in 2011. Uh, we had done a sort of nights and weekends prior uh, for a few years, but uh, failing at different things, but then finally succeeding on this, on this concept. How do you go from Exxon to this? I mean, how'd this start boiling in the back of your head? It's a really good question. Um, I started out my career very much on the science side of things. Uh, so spent a lot of time in Exxon's research labs, focused on physics simulation, high performance computing. Um, but a lot of what I did did not do anything with the internet. And so I've always had sort of this burning idea in the back of my mind that I wanted to start something, I wanted to build something, um, but I was missing on this thing called the internet. And so when the opportunity came along uh, with my two co-founders and uh, Joel in particular, who's our CEO, um, I've been friends with him since I was in, uh, like 12 years old. So we've been friends for a really long time. Um, so I was sort of his first call when uh, we were first discussing the idea and uh, couldn't pass up the opportunity. Interesting. How did you, you taught yourself to code via Exxon? Yeah, exactly. So I was a professional software developer there and I led software teams over there. And um, one of the things that we focused on there a lot was uh, was data and processing data, understanding data. Um, people talk a lot about today machine learning and data science and, and those types of things. Um, the oil and gas industry has been doing that for years and years and years before it was popular with the modern cloud platforms and modern tech businesses. Um, but taking that concept and providing it to hospitality. So this was the appeal for me. Um, Hospitality historically has not been a data-driven business. It's been restaurant owners who provide hospitality, cooking food and providing hospitality. And they haven't thought about their business in a very deep way uh, from a data-centric viewpoint. And so the opportunity here was, can we build technology that doesn't really replace the human touch, but just enhances it, uh, while all the while providing uh, the operators the opportunity to have a data-driven business for the first time. So launched in 2011, how many customers have you scaled to today? We have thousands of customers today across the globe, uh, across 250 cities. Okay. And how many locations? Um, we don't disclose the exact number, but it's in the thousands. Okay. Got it. Um, what I'm trying to get to is when someone signs up with you on average, are they managing one location or are there, it's actually enterprise sale. You're, they're managing a hundred locations. There's, there's sort of, it's sort of across the board. So, uh, we have independent operators that are sort of the neighborhood mom and pop shop. Uh, we also have large multinational hotel chains. So yeah, yeah, I, t- I totally get that, right? You're going to have customer cohorts all over the place. I'm just trying to get a sense. So uh, your sweet spot is what? Is it the Longtail Mom and Pop or the Enterprise Marriott deal? It's definitely a multi-unit groups. But I think the sweet spot is sort of a red herring because we're just as useful for a group that has 10 locations versus one that has 300. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but, but definitely multi-unit groups is our sweet spot. Yeah, and, and it, just to be clear though, I mean, someone that has 300 locations versus someone who has 10 they have basically the same needs, but there are things you can go deeper on if you really chose to only focus on one of those exclusively. Sure, that's right. Um, and I do, I do think like the, the more locations, the better. So we definitely, we trend in that direction. 
Um, but one thing we always talk about is punching above your weight class. We want to give restaurant operators the ability to have the capabilities of a much larger organization uh, through the data and the tools. That's something they haven't had before. Yeah. Have you guys decided to bootstrap the company or raise? Uh, no, we've raised capital. So the first, uh, we're, we're sort of untraditional in many ways. Uh, the first uh, five years of our company, we had raised from private investors and angels um, and kind of built the product and built the company initially that way. Um, and then we took our first institutional raise in the end of 2017. Uh, from Comcast Ventures. Okay, so total into the company to date is what? Uh, a little bit over twenty million dollars. A little over twenty, and how much was from Comcast? Uh, so Comcast funded about a quarter of that. And, um, and why Comcasting? Was it strategic or what? Um, it's a little bit of both. So one thing that's interesting that people don't realize about Comcast is that they actually do own a lot of hospitality outlets, and they're connected to them through NBC and Universal theme parks and other things. Uh, so we thought that was an interesting strategic thing. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the partner that we're working with, Dinesh Morjani. Um, he's someone who understands local. He built City Search back in the day. Uh, we thought he was a really great partner to work with, and he really did our business. And w- shape the team for me today. What are you guys at team size wise, and where's everyone based? Uh, so we're about ninety people today. Uh, the vast majority of us are based in Manhattan, here in New York City, in Chelsea, um, and that includes pretty much every department from engineering and sales to customer success and on- onwards. Uh, we do have a few folks sort of scattered in different parts of the U.S. from a sales perspective, but most everyone's here in New York. Let's talk more about the sales, right? So, so what is your and, and your, you're the engineering side? It's probably a wrong conversation to have with you, but your t- your sales machine right now is it kind of an ABM approach inside sales? What's it looking like? It's primarily inside sales. Uh, so we have all of our sales reps here in New York. <laughs> uh, we do have a few folks doing outside sales, but it's primarily inside sales. Okay, so your first 100 customers. Walk me through how you guys hustled to sign those folks up. Um, through a lot of manual effort. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um, tell me the pain. I mean, what was manual? What'd you do? Yeah, so uh, the first set of customers that we got in the early days, we really spent a lot of time building relationships in the industry. So one thing about uh, food and beverage and hospitality in general is it's sort of an incestuous industry. Um, everyone kind of knows everyone, and there's a little bit of a herd mentality as well. And so breaking into that sort of club of people that know each other, uh, that was really difficult in the beginning. We How did, did you do it, though, like specifically? Yeah. So we did everything from shadow host stands uh, to work at nightclubs in the Wait, evenings. what is that? Shadow host stands? Uh, so when you walk up to a restaurant and they're checking you in for your reservation, um, the people that work there, the reservationists, the hosts, we would actually go to those restaurants and spend entire shifts, dinner and lunch shifts, uh, behind them, asking them, hey, can we just see how you guys do this? And let's see what happens in the restaurant. And through that experience, we built relationships and started connecting people. Oh, and that's how we got our first set of customers. Interesting. Okay. They're available because they have to process guests coming in. So you're like, heck, why not in between them checking people in, we'll just go stand behind them, build a relationship, watch how they use the software and learn. Exactly. That's exactly what we did. So it's a lot of sort of hustle, sweat and tears. <laughs> really, really interesting. Okay. Uh, and then look, once you get the flywheel going, churn becomes really critical. What's your churn look like today and how do you keep it low? Yep. So we've actually got a really great churn rate. We have a 99% gross retention uh, on the MRR side. So uh, really, really good from, especially for a business in hospitality. Annually or monthly? That's monthly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, got it. So said differently about, about 12% uh, annual churn in terms of revenue. Right. On a gross basis. And I think, um, you know, we're, we're starting to open up new products this year. So we do expect that to be greater than hundred percent. I mean, look at that basis. That same cohort that you signed up about a year ago, if 12% of that revenue churns, I imagine there's also expansion on that cohort as well Is the expansion more than what churned. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's going to increase this year, especially we're going to release some new products. So uh, we really expect that to, to drive up quite a bit. But by about how, like, is it about equal? So you're about 100% net revenue retention? I think it'll be more than 100%. Okay, but but historically, what was it at last 12 months? Historically, so from a gross basis, it was 99%. Yeah, I know. I'm asking for net. Net revenue retention, about 100%? So, yeah, it's about 100%. But it depends how we consider it because we, we think about it in terms of locations and not in terms of customer expansion. So we have customers, for example, that have like 20 locations, but it's usually an all or nothing thing. You're not going to get two of those restaurants and not get the other 20. Okay. Wh- why is that the case? I would imagine if I was going to try something new like this, I'd try it on one. If it goes well, I'd expand to then North America. And if it goes well, then I'd expand to North and South America and then the world. Why would they, why would someone sign up all thousand locations in the first shot? Uh, so we do do trials. We do do trials and we do do pilots. Uh, but we typically, depending on if it's paid or not paid, of course, that will determine the number. But um, what we do find is that the benefit of the system is having data that's shared across all your properties, right? So if I've got locations that are, um, whether the United States or whether they're abroad or whether in Europe or just some other city, the benefit really is understanding that, for example, Nathan's profile, when he visits one location, he goes to another location, that's all part of the same system. So when you roll out to really realize the benefit, you really want to sell on all your locations. So we see a lot of our deals are typically trialed out a couple locations in the beginning. 
But then when we actually sign the contracts, it's usually for all the locations. Uh, okay, interesting. So you don't have the ability to really drive meaningful expansion by adding locations. You're going to have to release new products and use that to drive expansion. Exactly. Uh, interesting. When you look at fully weighted CACs, you have a sales team. You're, I imagine you're not going around shadowing anymore. But when you look at fully weighted CAC to get a new $500 a month location, what are you spending to get them? We don't reveal that number exactly, but what I can tell you is that we do have a less than 12 month payback period. Uh, so it's pretty healthy. Okay, so less than 500 bucks there. And and where are you spending that money typically? Uh, mostly in sales. It's sales and marketing. Headcount? Uh, really, yeah, exactly. It's usually headcount. Uh, interesting. Okay, good. And then, so so how do you, we talk about new product lines. You have infinite possibilities with data and kind of the, the distribution channels you built. How do you decide what products to build? Uh, it's a really good question. Uh, we get a lot of different sources of data for that. So one area is just the customers themselves. They're always telling us new things that they want. Uh, but from a new product revenue generating standpoint, we're really looking at changing some of the existing tooling that they have today. Um, one area that we're really interested in is restaurant marketing. I think if in the last 10 years you asked a restaurant, what do they do for marketing? It's typically like I get a food critics review and then I outsource on some reservation platform somewhere. Uh, but the world really has changed. We now have social media, we have ad spend, we have all these different avenues online to market and get guests. Uh, and right now the restaurants are not really using those capabilities because they don't know how to, but they don't have a tool that makes it easy. Um Interesting. How do you though, how, again, you're always gonna get these ideas coming in. How do you guys say yes, say no to things? This is the paradox a lot of entrepreneurs run into. I'm just curious how you prioritize, especially being an engineer. Yeah. So, I mean, our product team and our engineering team, we're very, very practical. Uh, we like to do a lot of hypothesis testing with customers. So for example, um, if we're looking at building a new product, the first thing we want to do is mock it up and show it to customers even before we built it. Right. Yep. So we spend a lot of time wireframing and talking to customers that we already have. Um, and if it's a targeting a specific niche or a certain segment of the market, then we want to do that specifically. Um, but that's that's usually our process. We do that and we get feedback. Uh, and then we start building things that people say, hey, I really want that or that's going to really help my business. But everything we, we do is try to be value driven, right? We're either saving you money or we're making you money. Mm -hmm. When you look at growth, obviously you're a funded company. So there are certain growth expectations you've got to hit. What do you hope to grow out over the next 12 months in terms of percentage, uh, you know, percentage points? Uh, so over the last year, we have grown close to 300%. Oh, great. Um, we want to try to maintain that growth rate this year as well. Well, you know, that gets much more difficult the larger you get, obviously. So uh, so congrats on getting that. It'll, it'll be interesting to see if you can keep it. Um, what do you think most of that growth will come from new customer additions or expansion of wallet share via the product additions? I think it's going to be equal parts, both. 50-50. Yeah. Um, okay. Great. And then look, we can kind of, we can back into some minimums here, right? So a thousand locations, we said, you said specifically thousand, you have thousands of locations. So if I assume a minimum there of a thousand at 500 bucks a pop, right? You're doing North of 500 grand a month right now at this point, correct? North of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a minimum. Yeah. So, so I guess the reason I'm asking you is the law of large numbers makes it diff difficult to grow 300% year over year, eventually at some point. I mean, what's your next big target? Is it kind of a 10 million, 50 million? What do you, what's the next big stretch goal? Um, so I think, well, double digits for sure. Um, and we're definitely in a series B stage. Uh, so if I put it in that context, it's probably helpful for you, but, um, I, th I think we can maintain 300% particularly because we have new products coming up. Uh, so from an MRR basis, I think we can maintain that growth rate, uh, quite healthily from a location standpoint. Of course, the market's wide open. Uh, there's thousands and thousands of restaurants out there in, in particular reservation taking restaurants. There's lots in the U S but there's even more internationally. Um, as I mentioned, we're in 250 cities already, and not because we have sales team in 250 cities. We have uh, organic expansion through existing accounts. And so uh, because of that, we think the market's just wide open at this point. You said double digits pretty confidently. I mean, is that 10 million mark really, I mean, you're pretty confident you guys will be able to knock that out this year, or is that still a stretch goal? Um, not a stretch goal. Okay, pretty confident there. That's good. And then um, when, when you start, when you say Series B kind of company, look, there's a lot of Series B companies that when you look at their ARR to funding ratios, they're way out of whack. I mean, they've way raised like 20 times what their ARR is. So it's hard to, it's hard for me to understand what that actually means from your perspective. So the question I have for you is, um, how far ahead of revenue are you raising for? Um, that's a good question. Um, we are looking at a profitability scenario in the next 12 months. Um, but we're also wanting to fund growth. So um, when I think about the amount that we want to raise versus where the revenue is at, I, I could say it's healthy. Um, again, we don't disclose the exact number, but sure. uh, you know, we think it's very healthy. Well, I mean, look, we, we know you're not at 10 million yet and you've raised 20 million. So it's at least a point, kind of a 0.5 ratio, right? Now, do you have plans to raise additional capital over the next 12 months, considering the last raise was back in 2017 with Comcast at 8 million? Uh, not currently. We don't have any plans at the moment. 
the, the revenue is growing at such a great clip that uh, at the moment we just want to get to a point of profitability and then we'll, we'll decide along the way. Uh, I'm not going to say that it's out of the question, but uh, certainly at this point, we have pretty good line of sight. And and profitability, obviously, you're not going to get there by cutting expenses. It's by driving revenue growth. You you really feel like you'll be able to hit that in the next 12 months? Hopefully. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. All right. Very good, man. Uh, let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Uh, favorite business book? I've got two. So the one is uh, The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz, which I really love. And then um, the blog post from Joel Spolsky, who are now discontinued, but those I really love those back in the day. The chaotic flow ones. Is that what you're talking about? Oh, no, the the, uh, the Fog Creek founder, Joel Spolsky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't, wasn't, the, uh, wasn't the site he blogged on chaotic flow. Am I getting those mixed up? Uh, no, he had his own personal blog. Uh, Got it. He had a lot of content. He was one of the first bloggers about tech online before it became popular. Interesting. All right, number two, CEO you're following or studying? Uh, that's a good question. I'm really fascinated with Sam Altman. He just seems like a, an alien from another planet, but just thinking about things very differently. Number three, <laughs> what's your favorite online tool for building a business? Uh, probably say Google Sheets. And number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Uh, maybe about six and a half. And situation, married, single kiddos? I am single. Okay, no, no kids running around New York? No kids running around New York. Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> All right. <laughs> how, how old are you? I'm 34. Last question. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? Um, uh, to know less, actually. Being naive is a great asset sometimes. Guys, stay naive. Coming from Kinesh again, launched seven rooms back after leaving ExxonMobil and spending a lot of time thinking about data and internet. They now have about a, over a thousand locations using them, paying 500 bucks a month. So north of 500 grand per month in revenue right now, or about a five, $6 million run rate. With eyes on breaking 10 million, hopefully this year, and then continue to drive 300% year over year growth as they scale, hopefully reaching profitability in the next 12 months. They've raised 20 million bucks to date so far, a team of 90 in New York City remote locations. Again, really helping rest restaurants with a lot of locations get better at data and sharing data across locations. Uh, they've got a 99% gross retention in terms of MRR monthly, 12% expansion. So about 100% net revenue retention right now, hoping to drive expansion over the next year with new addition of new product lines, payback periods on new customers, less than 12 months. Kanesh, thanks for taking us to the top. Yep. Thank you.